and now the director of Sunseed the Journey and today's host, Amartat Kohn. Our very special guest today is Robert Thurman, an American author, academic, and unstoppable force of knowledge and compassion. I came here to get us turned on to the idea of compassion and, and to fortify what little baby Jesus was trying to tell us before the Romans strung him up. The New York Times hails him as the leading American expert on Tibetan Buddhism. From Buddha's point of view, his discovery is that every sentient being, including cockroach, is the one. They all have the ability to be aware, completely aware of the reality of themselves and their environment. Bob was the first Westerner actually to be ordained by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, as a monk, but it didn't suit him. After a few years, Bob realized he wasn't meant to be a monk, and he came back to America, finished his studies, and became a professor of Indo-Tibetan Buddhist studies at Columbia University. All I want to, us to get, get to is to really shift and to become fully critical of our own brainwashing of all the things that we wrongly still do believe, like that like death will just be the end, and so that's the last of our problems, you know, which is a fake, puts us into fake recklessness. Get ready to be blown away into reality. Bob, welcome, and thank you for sharing with us your valuable time today. Well, thank you, Amartat, and, uh, and folks, don't take that introduction too seriously. I'm just a retired <laughs> old fogey, and, uh, but I'm very happy to speak to people on these topics, and uh, basically because when I speak to others about it, then I think about it, and then I feel better. <laughs> with the world the way it is. Once I was able to retire from one of the lead institutions in this culture, I'm able to be more openly confrontational toward it. And, and, that, and that I'm sort of not still in the so-called academic thing, which has become a kind of rationalization institution of, so, you know, of not listening to the scientists and not really changing our ways and banishing all spirituality. In this ridiculous fake thing that we do, uh, which is led by our natural scientists, which is one of my main purposes nowadays. I should actually write a book only on this. I think I will. But it's always part of all of my books now. But the main thing is we are handing out indulgences to a kind of heaven to, the, to everybody, making them reckless and living meaninglessly and recklessly and carelessly by pretending that we know that when they die, they're going to be anesthetized. Pretend that you can nuke somebody and then you just die and you're anesthetized from the consequences of that killing. And that is completely fake reassurance since nobody knows actually that nothing awaits you. And not only that, but it's insane to believe in that because in fact, news flash on Amartat's show, you heard it here, nothing, is actually nothing. So it's not a dark space. You can go and sleep eternally without any bad dreams. There's no such thing. And there's been no discovery of that. No scientist has found it. It's not an empirical discovery because guess what? No one has ever discovered nothing. It's a word for what you don't discover. So to have a blind faith that that's where you're going is a sign of cultural, a personal and cultural insanity. Well, you know, I'm I'm caught up in that insanity. I mean, uh, I've ever since I was a child, yes. I was always fascinated and, and fixated on thinking about what happens when I die, oh, and what I you. would, and, and I would try to go into you know at five and eight years old, really get into that thing, and what all anything I could come up with, honestly, was yeah. nothingness forever, nothingness forever. You say you came up with it, but actually what you did is you, you became a, a proper card-carrying member of a nihilistic society, totally. a nihilistic culture, which feels no compunction and is recklessly destroying the entire environment for human beings by thinking that, well, if everybody dies, it's meaningless anyway. Even being alive is meaningless because there's no spirit, there's no mind, there's no soul. That's an old superstition. And we, we empirical, rationalist scientists 
have discussed and scientifically oriented even humanists is we have discovered that actually nothingness reigns. But in fact, we haven't discovered that. We only project that self-servingly and actually meaninglessly and insanely. Since nothing is nothing, it's not a dark space. In fact, what we've learned from falling asleep every night and pseudo dying is that we wake up again in a dream and we wake up again in the morning, in the freaking morning. But, but Buddhism, hold on now, Buddhism believes in reincarnation. What, what, what do we have as proof or how can we do that without being blind belief? The proof of it is that you wake up after you fall asleep and you how have a know after it. The proof is not to be proven that there is continuity of experience. The proof is anybody who would say that it can become nothing. Since there is no experience of nothing, when you fall asleep, in fact, you simply fall asleep, you, your experience is going unconscious. Once you're unconscious, there's no sense of time, so you have no experience of being unconscious, actually. So you're therefore not experiencing nothingness. You're just deludedly told you're experiencing nothingness, so that when you wake up, you interpret, oh, I was in nothingness. How do we and know we wake up? Yet, we have the law of thermodynamics that energy is never destroyed. It only changes shape or dissipates. So our energy of being a live being will be continue when this body is no longer serving it. So just like, in a dream, just like in a dream, your body is not running away from the demon chasing you in the dream. It's not having an orgasm from the sex event you're having in a dream. It's not participating in any of those things, but you fully participate without the body. That's another proof. If you would look sensibly at it, you see, and break free of the reason, but it's very hard to break free because A, everybody else believes that, even if they think, oh yeah, I have a former life, I was Cleopatra, I'm Elizabeth Taylor, but I was Cleopatra, that's why I got the role. <laughs> in the future, I'll be another one, and another, whatever, it's just ridiculous. Well, and you know, I have no problem <laughs> believing in the continuity of, of the body deteriorating and becoming part of the earth and even the mind energy the energy of life force okay. could be but i will not be there anymore i won't no, know that i will be that what is that I, I, i'm enjoying myself too much here bob i don't want to have to well that's right you're scared, to, of it. scared of it as you should be in a proper prudential way you don't need to be scared of it because some sadistic god is going to throw you someplace horrible because you did something wrong or you didn't belong to something they want you to belong to. That's a fake thing based on sadistic rulers and sadistic high priests over the centuries who convince people that God is just like them and therefore intimidated them. You can have plenty of fun. So therefore, you, you're quite capable without being crippled in terror and having no fun of planning for next year and next year and next year, even though you might pass away before that out of this body. But we still will we providentially and prudentially take care of things and still have fun. So the idea that you can live in such a way as to book your a good room, book a good mom, book a good species, book a good planet in the future is not mutually mutually you know inconsistent. We can still have fun and still be responsible to our interconnectedness to the world through space and time. Instead of pretending that nothing is something and pretending it to ourselves because we really know it's not true because everybody subliminally knows and it, everything they've ever experienced is continuity. And continuity therefore is the default reality. From Buddha's point of view, his discovery is that every sentient being, including cockroach, is the one they all have the ability to be aware, completely aware of the reality of themselves and their environment. But the human among them is the most capable of being aware of that for two, for two op seemingly opposite reasons. One, because the human has much more self-reflection and language, like the lower animals, the beasts, we could, let's call them the beasts, and then the beings even worse than, the, than them um, have. So the human being can become self-aware a different, to a different degree, as well as many angels and gods that exist that are higher than human and have greater intelligence, but are more complacent because they're in an environment that doesn't 
they're not they don't feel vulnerable and they think they might stay there forever actually because they have very long lives whereas the human dies every hundred years and they are very vulnerable and yet they have that divine intelligence so so they they can really use this life to really try to understand themselves so it's the most advantageous evolutionary moment that we get and we have to earn if we fall below it below it and we have to be self-aware in a different way than gods and angels usually are, which is realize that we won't be there forever and that we better really widen our scope and become more and find the deepest layer of bliss possible, not any surface heavenly layer. And, uh, and so we all have that. You have that. I have that. And our dogs and cats have that. And uh, also there are beings that we don't even believe in in a materialist society who have that. And, um, and that's Buddha's discovery. And um, he doesn't ask that he be believed with any kind of blind faith. What he does is he provides a curriculum uh, for us to find out little bits of this, bit by bit, by revising our interpretations of what life is and what we are. And he does it on a planet where human societies have been organized for thousands of years to intimidate the individual members of the society and frighten them into suppressing their natural intelligence. And they've been taught all kinds of legends and myths, and especially whatever it takes that they are willing to be obedient to oppressive uh, chief, war chief, and oppressive high priest who or shaman who legitimizes the war chief. And between the two of them, they pretend that there is a god or some sort of authority above them that tells them what to do and gives them absolute power over you and your mind. And they pretend that their legends and myths are reality and you have to believe them. What we've learned, we have to question. So Buddha's whole thing was the original skeptical questioning of, of what, it, rather than indoctrinating you in something, Buddha has no doctrine for you, actually. He was the ultimate Socrates, but the point is Socrates is like Buddha, not really brainwashing you, but saying to you, you have the intelligence to understand yourself if you really use it. But we don't know that we're enlightened, actually. That's the problem. So, in fact, we are imprisoned in a cage of misknowing, not merely ignorance, which is, which is a passive, but it's misknowing. I think I know who I am. I think I know what's going to happen when I die, which is nothing. I think there is, even I insanely think there is such a thing as nothing, <laughs> the nothing thing, <laughs> the nothing something, which is because I think that my concepts correspond to reality, that they're given by reality. So therefore, since the wall seems to be over there, and then I have a word wall in my mind and a concept of a wall, if the word nothing is out there, there must be a thing. It's just nothing at all. Thank goodness I'm going to go there, which is what we all, because we do seek anesthetic when we have pain. We're not afraid of it. We crave it. When we have pain, we want anesthesia. So therefore, it was an easy sell for the Enlightenment people. But it's very damaging because it cripples you from achieving your full enlightenment that you naturally could have, having chosen the human rebirth yourself, which was not an obvious choice. When you were a grown-up senile crocodile, it, it was not obvious for you that you wanted to be amertat and watch Netflix and make podcasts <laughs> and be Mrs. Amartat mom's precious baby. It was not obvious that that was the best thing for a, for a dying crocodile to be. Rather, you would rather be a monster crocodile in the next life. And, then, and you didn't mind being born in an egg. You know, that would be the normal thing. So what made you think when you were beings like crocodiles? What made us think, me too? That we would like to be human, like we'd like to be born in New York, we'd like to live in Malaysia, we'd like to live in Woodstock. What made us think that? I totally loved your book. I just finished it yesterday. I couldn't have um, imagined about how we can all obtain this state, which is called yeah. enlightenment or nirvana. And I, I must tell you, my whole life, pretty much ever since I read Siddhartha, about 17 years old, I've tried to understand what is enlightenment. And I've, I've never seen a better explanation, explanations, as you did in your book. You know, one thing I'm trying to say, I'm so grateful for your praise, 
and I'm really pleased by it, but not because I'm, I'm not pretending that I fully understand what I'm writing. I want you to know that. I well, I didn't that. understand it all either. I'm okay, glad you did. But Buddha does, and Nagarjuna did. Tsongkhapa does, and actually I do really think his whole Dalai Lama does, although he might deny it, but as, as a good example, but, but I think he does. But, and I've had some older gurus who of his and mine who I think did. And I think I'm very close, actually, but I still don't. I'm an idiot still, actually. But you know what? When I, because I'm a friend, I've had such lucky relationships with those people that I just mentioned. And because of the texts of Nagarjuna and company and, and my Ashanti Deva and these wonderful people, because they, what they taught is like, it's like wisdom is bliss, but it's in these languages that we don't know. And that many great Zen people and nice people have taught also fully well, and I'm sure are more enlightened than me, but they didn't know the language. They didn't see it interacting with the English in a certain way. They didn't, they, you know, they prepared the way where someone could follow wisdom is bliss and someone of your intelligence and your background and loving our one Hindu, or I could even dare say Hindu Jew saint, Ramdas, because you're his follower, and he is a true saint who was an uptight Harvard professor prick before that, but he actually became a saint thanks to Nimkaroli Baba, who is a Buddha himself. Nimkaroli would understand it, I'm sure. It doesn't have to be a Buddhist to be enlightened, no, by no means. And so, there, so, but when I talk about it, therefore, because of the sources, I actually seem to understand it to myself, and it comes out in a way that another person who really tries to do it can understand it. And all I want to, us to get, get to is to really shift and to become fully critical of our own brainwashing of all the things that we wrongly still do believe, like that death will just be the end, and so that's the last of our problems. You know, which is a fake, puts us into fake recklessness. But to, to, to really, to really do the, but when we get into the flow of it, it holds us in a, in a situation where we can imagine being truly blissful. And then the little bit of bliss we get by loving any one thing in it is already touching our inner bliss. You know, there's a, there's a Bodhisattva Buddha, Bodhisattva called Manjushri. I think I mentioned him there. I salute him, but I just read something somewhere in an advanced book that I'm trying to finish translating, that the manju means gentle, manju means gentle. I think it's very auspicious that the second syllable is ju. I do, honestly and totally do consider that gentleness of those wonderfully intelligent, educated people throughout our world. It's wonderful. So anyway, Manju, and Manju means the soul, the deepest soul wherein we know the beauty of the universe, and we love it, and we're one with it. And then Shri, which means glory by itself, that syllable. The Shri means the clear light of the void, which means that the, the void, the seeming nothingness that happens when you look for something and don't find it, and you might say, oh, I found nothing because actually you didn't find nothing. What you found was everything else. Because when you don't find something, like you look in a room for an elephant, you don't find the elephant and you, you end up seeing everything in the room because you're searching it. So actually that's what the clear light is, it's called. It's the infinite energy, which is the bed of life, which is the life force. And people, some people personify it and call it God. Some people don't personify it. They call it wisdom, compassion, indivisible. So they call it clear light. That's what Buddha called it in his most advanced teachings. Some people, he called it nirvana in his most less advanced teachings because it's the nature of this here without it all disappearing. It's all good. Samantabhadra, they call it. All together good. And that's all I want people to switch around. And then when they know that wisdom is bliss and not ignorance, they'll learn more and they'll try to be more realistic. And when they do that, they'll be more free. And they won't be free in a sick, libertarian kind of sense of free to harm everybody else. They will be free to love everybody else. And they'll enjoy it then. You know, they'll be like Gene Kelly, dancing in the rain, because he's in love. So he doesn't mind getting wet. 
I'm so grateful to you, honestly, so grateful to you for having uh, having okay. done that book. But I, not that I could understand it. Now, get me wrong. I, I honestly, the, you see, wisdom the, is bliss. Here's my main point in that book. That's what I want to get to. Yes, please. Wisdom is bliss means that if you know what you really are, you'll be blissful. And it's the opposite of ignorance is bliss. If you just follow the, the idiot leaders who are filling you with irrational nonsense and telling you, follow me, because obedience is a big, important virtue. If you did that, then you will be blissful. And it's like you'll fall in love with the universe if you really know what it is. It's like if the people who live on this planet now, the elite, which you could say a mere 100,000 people probably, let's just give a rough figure, 100,000 people on this planet, who some of them, a few thousand of them go to Davos, and a few thousand of them don't bother, and they stay home in their bank and in their, their gated mansion, and you know, in community mansion, wherever it is, and go to a tax-free state like Florida and so on. You know, but there's a maybe 100,000 of them, and they are in love with wealth, and they're not going to be budged from their building up their numbers, even though they can only spend a small portion of it, and the rest of it they only have to worry about. But that group of people, if they really were in love with the earth, not just their own lawn, their own street, you know, 35,000 square foot house, you know, we're filled with people who are taking Prozac <laughs> because they're having to get along with a workaholic or something, a moneyholic. If those 100,000 people fell in love with the whole earth, every wetland, every platypus, every weird person, you know, they decided that they loved all of it because it was so beautiful, they would immediately stop damaging it and they would stop damaging themselves. By, by walling themselves off from ple pleasurable social interaction with more than a few chosen people who are mostly sycophants probably and who don't really like them because they're so oppressive and they're so unhappy themselves. And that's a fact. So wisdom is bliss. And the reason that these people are like that is that they are taught from birth that reality is scary, that nature is red in tooth and claw, that every person who doesn't look like them who wants to devour them. That if they're male, maybe females want to really like domineer them. If they're females, they're right they're actually rightly aware that males probably want to just use them, you know. And 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 they're really scared. And then they're, if, if they're religious, they think God hates them because they because they're too rich, or God hates them because they're too lucky, or somebody's against them, or maybe they think God likes them because they're rich and they can buy their way to heaven, a few of them, maybe. But the point is, whatever it is, they're taught that they need someone else to protect them so they can hire a lot of people with the wealth, that everybody else is against them so they hide and guard themselves off and put themselves in a boring place with their wealth, that the earth is no damn good, whatever. Point is, those people that are not in love with life. They think ignorance is bliss. They don't want to know about the people, in homeless, starving, disease-ridden, addicted people lying in the street outside wherever their gated compound is. They don't want to know. They think ignorance is bliss. So I'm saying wisdom is bliss. If they really knew what it all was, it would all be, view, be viewed as the most amazing thing, life. And they are among the most amazing people, just somewhat deluded still, and able to magnify that delusion because of the wealth to sort of hellish heights and they're imprisoned in their golden cages and they're showing it they show it by what do they want when they have hundreds of billions they want to go to fucking mars excuse my language they want to go to mars why is it that so many people uh are already have that potential for enlightenment but so many few people ever actually reach enlightenment well this is this i know this question my my first book in this popular genre was called uh, Inner Revolution. And in that I spoke about a cool revolution, which was Buddha's revolution, which was not hot. In other words, it wasn't just changing the rulers in an authoritarian, nasty place. It was changing the people in their heart to make their own hearts not nasty. You know? And that's a cool revolution. That's an educational revolution. You know, it's a thing like that. Where's the, all the cool heroes? Where are they? 
what, what, what do you mean? Well, this has been happening for thousands of years. Well, where are they? We have one or two saints here and there, but like, forget it. You know, everybody's dog eat dog. So that's BS, you know. And I was almost stuck. And then what came in my mind in that it was a talk show sort of thing, was I actually, in those days, you could promote a book <laughs> with a tour. And, uh, and, uh, and then a picture came in my mind of a family squabble. And, uh, and I realized who's in the middle of the wrestling trying to cool the stupid hot tempers down, of which I grew up with a very hot temper from a, a beautiful <laughs> older brother. And it was, there was a woman in there. There was a mom or there was a sister. And they were like, no, no, you didn't really mean that. No, no, don't, oh, no you don't want to do that. No, you don't want to hit each other. No, no, Let, no, stop this. And then getting blows in the middle and stopping it. And who's the glue that has held every family together in the middle of this militarized, authoritarianized, emotional plague-ridden cultures that we've grown up in? The women. But... In general, the women stay more cool. In a crisis situation, their brain, the neuroscientists tell us, emits neurooxytocin. And they, get, uh, they look for allies. They look around and see if there's some alternatives. They look for options. The male in that same situation simply blows up and charges straight ahead and smash down whatever seems to be in front of them, including someone they actually love when they're calm, for example, often. And so what is enlightenment? Enlightenment, because you see, we wrong to have the idea that enlightenment is some sort of genius who can talk a lot. Whereas really enlightenment is kindness, a person who is kind. So, so my point is, if you realize that enlightenment is compassionate, care, love, kindness, and then you realize that you feel good when you are kind, and you feel maybe sometimes you're taken advantage of when you're kind and compassionate, and other, other considering and altruistic, you do feel good when you do it. Sometimes maybe you're taken advantage of it, and then you, you reinterpret the whole experience as bad because somebody took advantage of you. But actually, you naturally feel good. Then you realize for you that enlightenment is as enlightenment does. You know, Buddha is as Buddha does. And that soul that we have, that Jesus saw, that Buddha saw, that the great Upanishadic masters saw, that Confucius saw, that Lao Tzu saw, that Pythagoras saw, that Socrates saw, that Zoroaster saw, all in the middle of all these empires and these big rulers and these people with the emotional plague, violent people, Roman emperor, Chinese emperor, and so on. But still, this, this soul is there, uh, the good soul of the, of the sentient being who is a vessel of this infinite life of this wonderful energy that is, is the life energy, that is the more powerful energy, the good energy, that's more powerful than evil and selfishness and stupidity and limitation, and is unbounded in its, in its, in its reality. And uh, the, the tiniest bit that we turn toward it, we are illuminated to it. And all, on the tiny bits, cumulative, you know? And that's why, why do you love talking to people, Amritat? that you do wonderful podcasts and you try to lift people's thinking. There's a livelihood component, but you do it because you love talking to them. People you may not know, Amritat, the name comes from Amrta, which is a Sanskrit word for deathless. It literally means without death, free of death, and death free. And what that is, is a word for Buddha's enlightenment, he said in his final moment that when he, in the great moment he achieved enlightenment, he said, I have found an experience, I have experienced a reality that is like a deathless elixir, amrta, amrta vat, like, just like amrta's name, like a deathless elixir. And it is, it is profound, it is, it is peaceful, it is uncomplicated, it is uh, unelaborate, rather unelaborated, perhaps we say, it is clear light, it is transparent, that means transparency, and it is uncreated, meaning it's, it's always been that way. Like a deathless elixir is the reality I have discovered, I have experienced, I have found, that's what he said. And then he said, whoever I teach it to, 
they might not understand it, so I'm going to stay by myself here in the garden of the forest and remain silent, he said. That is, he made that expression of non-dogmatic diffidence afterwards. But because in a way, what he's saying by doing that is he's putting the responsibility back on all of us. It, it, it is We cannot simply pick up on some formula or some credo or some mantra, and that will cause us to be enlightened. We cannot expect it from the outside. We have it in the side, and therefore even with his silence, seeing us like that, he is faithful, he has the faith, he has the confidence, he sees us as reaching our own enlightenment. So it's not only that, but he, and he wants to avoid dogma and he wants to avoid absolutizing whatever he might say so that we will think about it carefully and use it ourselves rather than thinking of it as some absolute dogma. Because one of all our human problems since we're this highly evolved being that's a human is that we are indoctrinated and brainwashed and and suppress our, our intelligence, our natural intelligence, which is perfectly suited to understand reality thoroughly ourselves, but we are suppressed. It's dampened down. We're, we're like a horse with blinders on it, where it's dampened down for us not to be able to see. Because so why they, should we meditate? Why should we meditate? We meditate at all? So the point is, when you meditate to not be there, you are you are actually simply realizing the psychotic culture that we live in where we're not you have no value as an individual you're basically nothing and you'll think ah oh, i'm in a, i'm just space and then you'll talk about you like there are zen people who run around saying oh yeah you get really spaced out that's the whole big thing is to be spaced out that's enlightenment and that is not enlightenment that's a trap actually that's a psychotic trap and it's falsely thinking that a psychotic trap is nirvana. So my teacher did what honest Buddhist teachers always do in, in Buddhist cultures, is they don't let you meditate right away, actually. If you come and say, I want to meditate, Guruji, Lamaji, Roshiji, they say, no, you can't meditate. You first go read a few sutras. You first read of some former life stories of the Buddha. You first get like connected to your family. Descartes calls it meditating, his meditations. That's analytic th thinking. And he reached the Buddhist point where he couldn't find himself. But, but then he at least resuscitated his thinking. He said, well, as long as I keep thinking, I'm here. <laughs> but he didn't, because he didn't have a Zen master to help him further to be both simultaneously there and not there, which is enlightenment. So in other words, we are capable of understanding ourselves and the world and that we are a totally interconnected bit of the life force infinitely interconnected with everyone else, ultimately the same as all of them, we're all one. My first teacher, anytime I started slipping out of my body when I first started meditating really strongly, he would show up if it was three in the morning and behind a tree in the garden. He'd be pretending he couldn't sleep and walk the dog and, and accidentally discovered me. But actually he was clairvoyant and knew where my mind was and I was slipping out of body. And then you can get in a state, a, du a dualistic state, where you, it becomes like your Prozac you're meditating. You go off and you just, you anesthetize yourself in a way, which doesn't improve how you have to come back and relate because it doesn't change the underlying pattern. You can only change the underlying pattern by going in with pattern unweaving and reweaving. And you have to do that right away. Then you learn to do that. And then when you use meditation to do that, it's more powerful. And then that's useful meditation. That becomes realization. But before that, meditation becomes simply deepening wherever you are at. And where you are at, when you're filled with misknowing, and it completely has shielded your inner Buddha nature soul, you're not usually going to do that. But when you redefine enlightenment as a beneficial, loving interconnectedness, rather than just a bright light bulb going off and being a junior Einstein, when you redo that, then you realize there are lots of cool heroes and even I'm enlightened when I'm nice. Have you met? Have I'm you actually met people that? Have you met people that you would say were enlightened beings in your yes. in this life? But you know, I admit my vision is fallible because I'm not perfectly enlightened myself. I'm enough enlightened to I think I've recognized by now. Didn't always. And actually, my one of my first and most amazing gurus or, or lamas, the Mongolian guy who was a layman, by the way. But he wasn't a monk, although he, he tried to create a monastery. 
And, and because he, people do need that. He refused to be my guru. And I said, of course you are my guru. And you even know when I'm meditating the wrong way and you interrupt me from, from when I'm far away. No, well, I don't know that's what they say, but I, I'm not your guru, he said. I'm just your friend, he said. I said, well, yeah, that's okay. And B, he said, if I was your guru, when I tell you something about yourself that you don't like and you become angry with me, that's a big sin for you. So therefore, I'm just your friend. And yeah, you can lose your temper at your friend nowadays. Then you might reconsider your friend's advice later. <laughs> and I've heard you say or someone say that the Dalai Lama was also your friend. He is my guru, yes. Well, he is when he's being a guru. So for years, and I, maybe it is all the time now, I have to say almost. I think when I finally, maybe because I'm getting a little close, maybe it'll only be the moment of death. And I won't go into regular bardo. I'll go into the clear light or something. Maybe, I don't know. I'm getting close. And maybe when I really see Dalai Lama as Buddha, I will I'll finally reach where I think I can maybe claim a little something, if it's useful in a particular context. What you said in your book. Um, yeah. And oh, yeah, the Corporation Prize. Yes. And what you, what you said in your book was that you don't uh, think you're yet enlightened. You're a work in progress. Huh? Yes. So, and yet you describe all of these inner experiences like so yes. elaborately. That, scientific where do you get that experience to talk about these things if you haven't yourself touched enlightenment at least for a moment? And is enlightenment a permanent thing or does it come and go? It is permanent. It's totally good. But it interacts with the impermanent totally 100%, does not abandon the impermanent in any way. And that's why it's said to be inexpressible because permanent, impermanent is a dualism. And you can't be what you have to be only one or another in a dualistic, linguistic, and, and, and structured conceptual world, world, world of interrelated, conceptually interrelated. So those are two opposite things. But uh, enlightenment is holding. You know who said so? Um, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Did you know that? He once said, it's so wonderful. This is this, what I'm saying, Curtis White. I'm promoting him. He says, but, you know, Transcendent, that book is so great. He says that the sign of a great mind, and, I, and maybe he didn't know about Buddha and didn't think he was mentioning a great mind by being a Buddha is a great mind. It's a title for someone with a great mind. Einstein was a kind of Buddha, I definitely think. But he says the sign of a great mind is the ability to hold two opposing things in mind at the same time without collapsing to either one and without being destroyed in between. So something that you shouldn't be able to do, in other words. He's saying Dude, that's something impossible. But to have Scott Fitzgerald, the great Gatsby writer, he said that's his definition of a great mind. So that is the that's the Buddha's definition, where he said that enlightenment and and which is the knowing of reality, and therefore reality itself is ultimately inexpressible. It's because it's more than any kind of dualistic thing can say good or bad or this and that. It isn't that. Therefore, there is no bad or good. It's that those things are there, but the, what in reality is deeper than those things. And actually, it's all good, he says. So even the bad is transmuted into good and uh, by reality. And uh, so, there, so it's all good. So in the book, I give the consolation prize to myself. Yeah, I was going mean, to end there, but, but uh, go okay. ahead. <laughs> tell us about oh, your oh, consolation you prize. Tell me, you tell me. But what it is, is uh, some, some point where you feel you have to be, you have to actually remember, you have to, you have to find such a bliss that not that you then are numb to pain, a kind of bliss where you can feel pain, but the bliss outweighs it. Uh, why? Because which 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 is again should be impossible, but we all know you've been in some bliss state yourself. You Amartat, I know you have. You've been a because you're a follower of Ramdas, so you have been in a bliss state where you could ignore pain that you were still aware of. So you know that's possible. 
So therefore, by by building on that as an analogy, that it's that even that analogy will not capture. A Buddha is a being who is completely in bliss, permanent, and simultaneously 100% empathetic with all suffering beings. They say a Buddha is even a simplistic level of Buddhism. They say a Buddha is like a mother who considers every being as if it, she, or he is her only beloved child. But it, could, it wouldn't be possible if there wasn't an underlying bliss that it seems to be that it's all made of that you see simultaneously so anyway but the point is therefore when you reach that in the ordinary buddha story remember buddha remembers infinite previous lives yeah. so his way of becoming infinite is that his bliss is his awareness that spreads everywhere beyond his body and in all the other bodies of all the other beings that both he was himself, and then second one is all other beings, all their previous lives, and all the futures. Yeah. I see it well enough now to know that, to feel I deeply know that I will reach enlightenment in some life. I don't know when. And I hope it's very soon, because we need a wide wave of it on this planet right now. So those 150,000 people who really could flip all the switches and give Greta back her future, a little bit less damage. It's already damaged, but she, they could give it back less. Will really decide to fall in love with Greta, to fall in love with the planet itself, to fall in love truly with themselves and be really proud of themselves and make the sacrifices necessary to change everything right now in this decade, right away, not half, by the 2050 and all this bullshit that they're selling, knowing full well they'll be dead and they're residing on the MIT telling them they'll be purely anesthetized. Nonsense. They know full well they are sensitive and they'll remain sensitive and the universe is sensitive and they should therefore be kind to it. So we need people to break through, not but just That's my question, that, exactly. We you, need you a lot of people. We do how? that, we have to do that now. We do. We're going to do that now. I have something I call, I have a plan for it, but I don't know, I don't doubt I like to do it in this life, but it will happen. Somebody else will do it. I call it the bright money campaign, not the dark money campaign, the bright money campaign. We are under the control of the dark money now. It's dark, it's like black coal, black oil, you know, and it's black carbon, it's burning carbon goes in the air. That's the dark money. They bought all the governments. They subsidized the, car, the, the petroleum industry $500 billion a year. Yeah. They get subsidized before they sell us the products for many hundreds of billions, maybe trillion. But before they sell us that, they are subsidized $500 billion, which gives them enough money to buy all the governments to ensure that that subsidy continues and or increases. Isn't it obvious? So we're, we are, the people of the world, by being confused, are committing suicide. Through the agents of that are these, these 150,000 people, or 100,000 people, or whatever. I don't know the exact number, but they own all the governments. The other people are more, much more numerous than them. We're 8 billion of us. If we could shift it around, and we, he, he calculated that if we spend 1.5 trillion, which is only three times as much as that subsidy, on mitigation and transfer and, you know, uh, you know, renewables and even clean nukes, there are such a thing as small scale cleanish nukes. You know, that we don't, it doesn't all have to be. You know, there, there's everything is complicated. There's all, you know, and I won't get into that. But we could easily switch it. And there's another guy, Kim Stanley Robinson, who I love to promote, who is a science fiction writer. And he wrote a great book called The Ministry for the Future. And in that, he has the world, in, because it's sci-fi, doing what I'm talking about in the 2040s or trying to do it. I won't, I won't give away. It's a novel. So it's, it has suspense and it's difficult. And, you know, trying to do this, making this shift 
in the 2040s when things have become so much more cat catastrophic. So my, I, my plan is the bright money one, which is uh, creating a ministry for the future now and not just 1 billion or 10 billion, you know, maybe 100 or something, a lot of money and making the inconvenient truth available in Swahili, in Hebrew, in Persian, in Arabic, in, in Hindi, in Telugu, in Tamil, in Bengali, in Gujarati, in Chinese, in Japanese, in Korean, in Russian, in every language. And I'm working on another movie, actually, which I'm Sorry? calling I'm calling Sunflower, which will take I know the, you are. the seeds that, that were planted that's, that's and try to get the great wisdom in the world out. Uh, at the true. moment, the people don't that's believe that conscious media can sell, so yeah. I haven't been able to get the funding, but I will. It well, will you, see, you see, and if, Bright yes. Money Campaign, the Ministry from the Future, would fund a thousand movies like that right now with a really handsome budget, with, a, with also AI, industrial light and magic special effects to make the points, the quantifications and the points and the, and the ways in which the growth can be resuscitated from this and that. The Sunflower movie, I want to be in it. I want to see it. I want to show it. I want you to get funding. Let's do it. I want to talk about how you ended your book. It was just so, so beautiful. You said, I can be profoundly certain that I will also become such a Buddha, experiencing such a nirvana, to effortlessly bring other beings into their own blissful awareness of being. Okay. Uh, really, I, I, I urge everyone to read it. It's the most amazing thing that I have seen on explaining uh, what are the stages of nirvana, what are the stages that you go through to follow Buddha's teachings to get there. Is there, is there anything else that would yes. like to add? Why don't I add it in the form of the meditation? So now your meditation is to switch the default sense that we have of reality from that reality is somehow frightening, that it is somehow dangerous, that nature is red in tooth and claw, and I think Longfellow's phrase, that we're in a doggy dog Darwinian world, I think, and what the scientists tell us, that the religious people tell us that we're likely to be doomed to hell or some horrible state because we might have had some unvirtuous things and you know, Jesus might come for us or might not, we don't know, or Buddha or Krishna or whoever it is that we might believe in. So in general, we are indoctrinated to believe that, that we have to sort of secure our own perimeter, if you will, and close ourselves off and drop into a now that is disconnected from future because it's dangerous for lies in the future. You know? So we are going to be meditating on the opposite of this. We're going to imaginatively try for size, thinking of reality as pure goodness. What would it be like if we thought everything was good? If we were like a child, just seeing the universe as a giant breast with sweet milk, <laughs> vanilla flavored or mango flavored, or whatever we think of as a delicious taste. And the whole universe was just one big breast just for offering us this elixir of immortality. However you want to visualize it, maybe start small, visualizing yourself being on top of Mount Everest, if you're a mountain climbing type, without the trouble, maybe you got up there by helicopter, never mind. Visualize yourself being by the seashore in the most beautiful beach you've ever been to. Visualize yourself being in the most magnificent palace or mansion that you can imagine or in one of those amazing places in the Avatar movie where the, with the luminescent light at night. Whatever you think of as the most beautiful place and, where, and your body is feeling the total bliss. Imagine that your body feels really good. You don't have to sit up in some harsh posture if you don't feel like it. You could lie back and do this meditation or sit in the most comfortable chair. Anyway, remember a time when you were maybe had an orgasm or you had the most delicious feast where you were really blown away by that muso shokala or that you had some wonderful warm 
hot spring bath or something. I don't know. It's just imagine or remember supreme pleasure or what you consider the greatest moment of pleasure, and imagine that that's sort of there. You're having a dream about it, and then that that way think of the whole universe is like that. So, so whatever visual thing you have to think of, think of all the ones you've ever loved in life, being here with you in sort of Obi Wan Kenobi luminous bodies. Even they passed away. Even you, they divorced you. Even they separated from you. Even they, you lost track of them. Or all the people you've ever loved or liked, who have loved and liked you, are all there with you. So imagine whatever it is makes you feel really good. All around you, and being in the place—that's the supreme place that you would want to be, and feeling in the supreme way you want to feel. Completely, hell, every breath is like sipping the most delicious and most expensive elixir you can think of. Amrta, amrta, delicious elixir of immortality. Being in a tube of light. Tunnel of freedom, feeling completely one with everything around you and fearless. But imagine this in a creative way. Find it. Maybe you're finding it difficult to hold your memory of the greatest orgasm, to hold your memory of the greatest meal, of the greatest massage, of the greatest whatever was, skydive, where you felt fully free or something. And you can't hold, can't hold that in your mind. And a voice within you that you think of as your thinking voice. Saying what? This is nonsense. Reality is not safe. It's dangerous. There's all kind of rabid dogs out there. There's all kind of like there's germs, invisible germs coming from the from the bats. Covid, you know. There's all kind of poisonous food. If I could have food poisoning from thinking I'd eat some delicious thing, you know. Your mind is talking like that to you. I might maybe I'll die. I'll have a stroke if I feel too good or something. You'll feel if I didn't keep tight control of everything. So there's voices talking to you like, and ask them. Then you can think. You can meditate by being thinking too. Descartes did. You just start with the default feeling as good as you can, and the default visual perception of being in the best place that you can, and a false emotional feeling of being with the best people that you. Even people you never met, but you idolize—maybe some movie star, maybe a, some royal figure, maybe some Olympic athlete—or they're all there with you in subtle body form. And so you've tried to put all of your processes in the optimal mode, but you also now are thinking as sharply as you can think. You're thinking like Einstein, doubting whatever. And now doubt the dangers of these things, doubt the reality. What is death that you're afraid of? What is it? Where you leave the body? You leave the body every night when you fall asleep. You go unconscious, and you have a dream, and they're usually not that bad. And then you wake up, and you maybe feel more rested in the next day. So whatever it was when you slept, you weren't in nothing. There was no nothing to be afraid of. So defend your good feeling. On the emotional, sensual, visual, sensory, and consciousness levels, defend it with your thinking level by thinking critically, and how you are indoctrinated to be afraid of God, afraid Jesus won't come, afraid of wild animals, afraid of germs, afraid of all the many things you're afraid of. Why should you be afraid of them? You survive them. You survive being unconscious every night. You survive being in a world with dangerous dictators. You might not have. Actually, Buddha says you've survived many previous lives, and you're now here and enlightened. So now, now imagine 
you are on the brink of becoming fully enlightened. That is to say, not just imagining that reality is good, but he says, coming to know that it's good, omnisciently knowing that it's really, really good. So be in the moment of omniscience. Meditate that you are. Imagine that you are Buddha. So I remember all previous lives. So I have been every conceivable kind of being. And the second thing is, once I know all my own previous lives to infinity, I can see that all other beings have been there with me in the infinite previous lives. We've all been entangled infinitely in this vast ocean of energy that is the universe, where there's no nothing, where there's only something in infinitely. Therefore, there's infinite energy. It's infinite. There's nothing undone in it. We are part of its doneness. In fact, it's one with us. It is us. We are that energy. We are a form of that energy that is conjured up by misknowing a field of being separate from the larger field. We somehow did that. But now we're visualizing ourselves as one with it. That's what we will be when we are Buddha. And we will be that without being numb to any part of it. So the bliss we will feel of, its, of infinity will be so powerful that it can fully permeate every tortured feeling of finitude on the part of every being. It can be fully empathetic, feeling with every being, every suffering of every being. And yet it also simultaneously feels that being from within its own inner core as blissfully infinite too, only having shielded itself out of fear and misknowing and misunderstanding and misperceiving, having shielded itself into not being part of everything, not being one with everything. So at that time, though, we realize that we and all the other beings in our infinite entanglement have always been one with this infinite energy, which we call, which the Buddhists call, Shunyata Prabhasvara, the clear light of openness. The clear light of openness infinite energy which is not a white light it's not a dark light it's not a red light it's not a green light it's not a yellow light it's a transparent crystal light and now I we turn from this amazing imagined moment which is encompasses an infinite past towards an imagined moment that encompass an infinite future. Since space-time is also one thing, but it will not be a moment disconnected from past and future, which a materialist might think was a great salvation of being anesthetized, but numb, to be numb to everything. But no, bliss is not numbness. Bliss is infinite joy, pleasure, orgasmic expansion orgasmic surrender, delight, and infinite, because folding its way through infinite, limited beings, embracing them and to the degree of which they are capable of opening themselves. Shunyata, emptiness, best translation for it is openness. And in your knowing it, your confidence, knowing their future moment when they will also know it. So it all becomes a little bit playful, perhaps, and becomes a matter of artistry 
and the infinite energy becomes your palette and also your brush and also your canvas. And you become a poet and an artist and a sculptor of worlds. You don't create them, you sculpt them to optimize the experience of the beings who can use them as doorways to infinite openness. And beyond the duality of finiteness and infiniteness, finally. Beyond the duality of finally and initially. Beyond the duality of being and nothing. Beyond all dualities, inexpressible in any word, but knowable by every one of you in your deepest, loving, kind, creative heart. And every little bit of lovingness and kindness and openness. Right now, forever. Evam maya shruttam mekasmin samaye. Evam. Okay, ding. I don't have my meditation bell. I'm with that, okay? I'm sure uh, that will. Thank you, Bob. This has been fascinating, okay. our time together. Okay. I, I I have more questions. I hunger to go deeper, but next time. Next okay, time. Me too. I too, too. And to our audience, please share this Sunseed Wisdom Talk with your dear ones. It's going to continue to stream on Facebook and YouTube and on our oh, website, okay. sunseed.org. Please send me a link, you know. And I'll uh, definitely, I'll send you the whole thing. Uh, okay. But our, for our audience, you can go to sunseed.org forward slash wisdom talks. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Bob. Good afternoon. Good night. Good morning to you wherever you are. Om Mani Padme Om. That's it. Om mani padme hum, om mani padme hum. May you be blessed. Shalom Alechem. Assalamu Alaikum. Jai Ram. Om. Namaste. Amen. May the long time sun seed shine upon you.